Hello, my name is Raymond Hughes, and I'm the interviewer for the Veterans History Project. We are uh, conducting the interview today at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library, located, of course, in Cincinnati, Ohio. Today's date is the 21st of July, 2015. And today we have the honor and privilege of interviewing United States Air Force veteran, Lieutenant Colonel Charles L. Miller. Um, Colonel Miller is, if you the right to uh, refer to you like that, Colonel Miller, or Chuck, if you like. Okay. Uh, where, were, uh, where were you born, Colonel? What city and date? I was born in Carroll, Illinois, which is down at the base of the state of Ohio, where the, uh, Illinois, where the Ohio River and the Mississippi join, down in, the, in South, Southland. And I was born in uh, October of 1938. Lincoln referred to that as Little Egypt, didn't he? That's why it's named Cairo, <laughs> as it's pronounced there instead of Cairo. <laughs> I see. Yes. Uh, and uh, what were your parents' names? Uh, my dad was uh, Donald Austin Miller, and my mother was, uh, was Grace, and her maiden name, McDowney McDowney. Miller. Yes. Now, had your family lived in that area for a long time, or? No, my mother was from the Chicago area, and my father was born there in in southern Illinois. I see. Uh, and what schools did you go to down there, and how long did you attend schools in that area? Uh, I left there at the end of first grade. Ah. My dad was uh, a casualty of World War II in uh, December of 1944, and at that time I was just barely six years old, and we relocated to Chicago to my maternal grandparents' home with my mother and my brother. And when you say a casualty, uh, he was killed in the, in the artillery attack in the run-up to the Battle of the Bulge. I see. Do you recall what division and it, that your father was in? No, I can provide that to you. No. Uh, but it's, uh, he was only over in country for, uh, in theater rather, for less than six weeks when he was killed. I see. And there's a long story behind that, which I probably don't want to go into at this point, but uh, he, uh, he was killed and uh, his original unit that he trained with went separate ways during boot camp when he was hospitalized uh, for, for uh, yes, <laughs> for uh, double pneumonia. I see. And uh, they never went to the theater. He joined another unit when he finished his hospitalization and ended up in, in the European theater. I see. Now, so you went to Chicago to live with your maternal grandparents? Correct. And what were their names? Their names were McDowney, Maida, and, uh, and yes. <laughs> oh, goodness. It's all right. We, yeah. We'll come back to that. I'll come uh, back to that. So you went to grade school and high school in Chicago? I went to grade school in Chicago, in Chicago and a little short period of time in Bartlett, Illinois. And then we moved to Oak Lawn, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. And I finished grade school there and went to high school in the adjoining, adjoining community of Blue Island. I see. What was the name of the high school you went to? It was Blue Island Community High School. Blue Island. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, after high school, uh, what did you do? After high school, I went immediately uh, after summer into the University of Illinois in Champaign. And I was able to do that, my brother and I both, who, my brother's two years older. Uh, we both went to the University of Illinois under the GI Bill as a result of the casualty of my father. I see. And that is where I ultimately ended up in the Air Force because University of Illinois was a, grand land, a land grant college which required ROTC for all of its male students. So I went into the Air Force ROTC and ultimately passed all the physical and, and other exams and went into the advanced core of the ROTC there and uh, was a cadet officer. And from there, when I graduated the university in January of 1961 mm -hmm. with an aeronautical engineering degree, I also got my second lieutenant's commission and my orders to pilot training. And that was January of 1961? 61, yes. But aeronautical engineering was your, your degree? Correct. Mm -hmm. I see. So, um, 
Now, at this point, you're single. At the, uh, no, at the time that, uh, well, let's see, yeah, when I started college, I was single. We were, mm. we were married in the third year of college. I see, and what, what is your wife's name? Patricia. And Pat. Her, what's her maiden name? Uh, Ver Shave. It's a Scandinavian name. V E R S C H A V E. I see. And uh, you met her while you were in college? Yes. She, she's actually a neighbor of where we were living in Oak Lawn. Uh huh. But uh, she, she went to Oak Lawn High School, which was just being opened at the time that I started high school, and I went to Blue Island because it was already accredited. And my brother was going there, and we had, I had his transportation to get to and from since he had a car. So where did you meet your wife at? Uh, met her at a, uh, a small uh, mini putt-putt golf course and archery range. She was doing a one-night uh, set of fill-in, running one of the concessions there. Mm -hmm. And I had worked there myself as a teenager and uh, knew the boss very well. And he asked me if I'd like to provide her a ride home at closing time at midnight. And <laughs> that, that's how it all started. I see. And you got married in your third year of college? Uh, yes. Yes. And uh, we were married on campus. Actually, it was the fourth year, I guess, middle of the middle of the fourth year, and we got married on campus. She remained uh, living at home for about four or five months, and then she joined me on campus while I finished out the, the summer camp and, and uh, the summer month and the uh, last semester. I see, and. Uh, you didn't have any expenses or anything of that nature. Obviously, you had a room at the at the university. Well, when or, uh, or I had lived in a private residence hall there my entire time on campus until we got married, and we had a small apartment in the second story of a, a hundred-year-old farmhouse out in the country. I see. Okay, so. So you're married now, and you uh, are, have enlisted in the United States Air Force as a second lieutenant. Correct. Where did you, what was your first assignment as a second lieutenant? The first assignment was uh, to Valdosta, Georgia, Moody Air Force Base in pilot training. And I flew the uh, all-jet program that was the second year that the Air Force had taken the pilot training program out of contract hands into an Air Force, one-year Air Force program. And I flew the T-37 initially, twin engine jet, and uh, then into the T-33, which was the, the two-place version of the F-80, which was used first in the very tail end of World War II and in Korean War. Mm -hmm. They made a two-seater out of it called TF-33. And uh, I finished that in the, at the end of a year and then took an assignment out of the selection process to Chicago O'Hare, going back to hometown, so to speak, because of the nature of the assignment. And uh, that was flying the C-47 aircraft, DC-3, out of Chicago O'Hare's uh, National Guard facility there at the corner of the, of the airport. And uh, I flew the C-47 in a navigator training capacity where we were supporting the CRAF, Civil Reserve Air Fleet. If you're familiar with that program. No. It, was, it was one that, if, mind you, this was in the, in the early 60s, 1961, 62 time frame, And not too far from the end of the war, World War II, and the program was designed, the CRAF program was designed that if we went into a major war effort that uh, the government had contracts with all the commercial airlines that would take on the airlift requirements of the military with their established transports, but they didn't carry uh, international qualified navigators. So the Air Force established this CRAF fleet of reserve navigators that could be trained, proficient, and be able to get on the, the 707 or the commercial airlines airplane and do the overwater navigation and those types of procedures that they were not, the civilians weren't used to doing. Now, 
Are you saying that you were also trained as a navigator? No. No, no I, I flew the airplane. Okay. And we had uh, instructor navigators that our C-47s were configured with eight uh, student stations in the back of the airplane. And, uh, and an instructor navigator was overseeing their activities. And, uh, and you flew them around yeah, and we, over the we, water and We land. flew over water and over land and cross-country navigations, but all of the type that were not on airways as much as possible, in other words, in visual flight conditions. So uh -huh. they could plot the course and we could fly where they wanted to go rather than having to maintain a pilot-directed uh, electronic airway. <coughs> C-47 was a, one of the workhorses of our Air Force in those days, from World War II forward. From World War II forward, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how long were you there at O'Hare then? I was there for five years. Is that right? Yes. A f applying the C-47. Applying the C-47. And, uh, and uh, becoming proficient, it was an interesting transition because I had done all jet pilot training, which everything happened fast. and was fairly sophisticated in the, in the navi navigation equipment and avionics on board, getting into the old C-47, which was still virtually World War II vintage aircraft, but with the nav stations in the back and, and no autopilot and no uh, electronic instruments to speak of other than the basic things, very, very crude by the standards even that time. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I, of course, had flying, flown jet airplanes in pilot training. Now I had a bigger, much bigger airplane with two engines on it with those big fans on the front of them, props. Right. <laughs> that went very slow. Yeah. <laughs> Our cruise speed was under 120 miles an hour. So it took a long time to get anywhere, but we could fly 1,500 miles or so on the plane load of gas. So we went a long distances, but very slowly. I see. And things happen very slowly on the airplane compared to, we'd get on a final approach, flying out of Chicago here, the world's busiest airport, we'd get on a final approach intermixed with the 707s and the DC-8s and the other commercial jets. And uh, they were going probably one and a half times our speed in the traffic pattern. Probably took you as long to get a landing pattern as it did of some of your flights. Yeah, well, we'd, sometimes you could almost take time to have a cup of coffee from the time you came over the final approach fix until you touched sure. down. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's, ooh, this is really slow, you know. But it was uh, a real fun airplane to fly. Uh, Seat so of the pants all the way. In the meantime, are you promoted? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, during the course that I was O'Hare, I initially had entered through a ROTC, so I had a reserve commission. Right. And I was offered and accepted a regular commission. Uh, about six, eight months after I got to Chicago. I see. So I went regular, career guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I was promoted in the normal cycle. About a year after I got to O'Hare, I was promoted from second to first lieutenant. And then uh, over the course of the next three years, I, more or less, I was promoted to captain. I see. So I was a captain at the end of the tour of duty. At the end of it, so that takes us uh, actually to 1967. Uh, well, 66, 67, yeah, I was yeah. right at the end of the year. Okay, so and from there, where are you assigned? I was assigned with my background in flying time. By that time, I had over 2,000 hours in the C 47, and I was assigned to an EC 47, that's an electronic uh, reconnaissance configured C 47. And uh, I was designated as one of the pilots to ferry an airplane from the East Coast of the United States across the, the uh, island, hopping across the Pacific into Vietnam. So I, I ferried an airplane uh, across 28 days to get there. Uh, and leaving from the East Coast? Leaving uh, from the East Coast, yeah, New Hampshire. I, uh, at Portsmouth, New Hampshire? No, it was up north of, uh, of Boston at uh, Lanier Field, Grenier Field, excuse me. And uh, it, there was a major contractor's facility. This, the EC-47, I have a photograph of, yes. uh, of it if that would be of interest to the, no. to the uh, viewers. The top aircraft in the, in the picture there is the airplane I flew in Chicago, the TC-47, trainer configured, configured. The one in the middle is the actual aircraft that I ferried 
to Vietnam. And its tail number was 0065, and since it was a reconnaissance aircraft, we had it painted on the nose Snoopy. Snoopy? <laughs> Snoopy, almost 007. <laughs> right. And the bottom picture is another uh, artist's conception of the airplane in flight. So, uh, where did you fly to uh, in Vietnam then? Uh, I was based in uh, at Nha Trang on the coast of the South China Sea, which is immediately north of Cameron Bay, which many people have heard of, if they haven't heard of Nha Trang. Uh, and we covered the area of, uh, in our reconnaissance work from Nha Trang, from the uh, seacoast to the Cambodian border, all the way north to uh, Da Nang, to the central highlands. So you're flying from east to west and then north. And then north. Now our mission's electronic reconnaissance was airborne radio direction finding, where we would, I had a crew in the back of the airplane with some very sophisticated top secret equipment at the time that were able to find radio signals anywhere in the radio spectrum, whether it was high frequency, low frequency, or what have you. And their, their scope would show a track line where a spike would indicate any radio traffic and they were very well attuned to what they were looking for, shall I say, and they could run a cursor over to any high peak, which meant it was close to a strong signal, and then a pointer on the aircraft would point to the signal relative to the aircraft's heading. And then we would, we would fly a pattern around that signal to get several lines of position, as they call it, or, or bearings off of it, which the navigator would plot. And uh, with three or four or more plots, they could narrow it down to a very, very tight uh, location of that transmitter's antenna. They knew it was an enemy, enemy transmitter because they knew the signal, they knew the signature of the, the sender transmitter. And those plots were then <coughs> responsible for about 85% of all the airstrikes and bomb missions flown in South Vietnam. We didn't know that at the time, but that was released uh, about 10 years ago from our classified records. It was a top secret mission. Mm -hmm. <coughs> By the nature of the beast, the C-47 was low altitude, that is, it was not pressurized, and we had no oxygen on board for safety reasons because that burns very violently if you get hit. Right. So we were restricted to flying below 10,000 feet. And that meant that we were within 2,000 to 8,000 feet from the ground level because of the mountain areas that we were flying over. And of course, we were on unarmed aircraft, unmarked aircraft. We were just like any other crash hauler, goonie bird that was flying C-47 in the, in the theater. And our, our normal mission was probably seven to seven and a half hours in length. And we would just, we had our areas that we knew where there was potential traffic from the intelligence network. And we would go and fly any particular mission, we would fly to the target zone somewhere in that area and then random orbits for about six and a half, seven hours looking for enemy traffic. Uh, by enemy traffic, you mean these signals, radio was, signals? Ra radio signals that were emanating from the Viet Cong or, or the North Vietnamese. North Vietnamese, right. And uh, so you would fly out of what base again? Nha Trang. Nha Trang. N-H-A-T-R-A-N-G. Mm -hmm. We had three squadrons there. One was located at the time in Tansanut. There was ours and there was another one in Pleiku, which was up in the northern highlands closer to the DMZ. Yes. And we, we covered that entire area, plus a little bit of Laos, a little bit of Ca Cambodia, and uh, anything that was with, that we could fly within our territorial area and, and track signals. We also tracked them out at sea in the incoming ships. Oh, it had enemy right. cargo on it. Oh, I see. Um, did you ever cross the border of Cambodia or Laos while you were flying on these missions? Yes. I see. It, it was. Not acknowledged at that time, but right. I did. I see. It's part of the mission. That has to give you some, um, I, I, would, I don't know if the right word is comforting, but uh, to know that, uh, that you're responsible for helping uh, save our lives by the 85% that you say mm -hmm. of the airstrikes. Right. 
Yeah, it, it, it was very interesting because uh, one of the things that on our mission, we had an intelligence briefing before every mission and we got an intelligence assessment of where we were going to be operating. And in many cases uh, on mission and after subsequent mission, we were flying in the same area and we were following battalion sized forces of enemy concentrations and we knew where they were going. We knew uh, what their objectives were. We knew their strength. All of this was deciphered from the message content that they were transmitting, which we were recording as well as pinpointing the transmitters. And so we could know from our own battle, uh, our own intelligence sources of the forces on the ground, we knew what forces were in harm's way that were going to be overrun. And you could immediately transmit that information. No, at that time we couldn't, uh, we had to take all the data we had on the airplane at the end of the flight and download it and then it was then at the debriefing at, at the debriefing and it was sent up to Saigon or down to Saigon and, and uh, put into the intelligence network. I see. I see. All of that was all of that was in the top secret arena and as front end crew members, pilots and co pilots, we were not cleared to that full level of access. We knew a lot about what was going on, but the inner working details of the security service operation crew members in the back of the airplane was only known by them and the, the navigator who worked very closely right. with them. How many crew members were on the EC-47 EC that you were flying at? Yeah, the EC-47 had several configurations, but the ones that I flew on, we had a, a pilot, co-pilot, navigator, and flight engineer or flight mechanic as the air crew, the front end crew, so to speak, and the back end crew security service was anywhere from three to five or six operators, depending on the, the variant aircraft now, version. Were you, was your ship armed with any type of uh, weapons while you were flying these missions? No, no, it was totally unarmed except with the, the crew members had personal side arms. Side arms. I see. And did you, uh, have, you carry chutes also? Carry chutes, parachutes, no. Yeah. <laughs> As I recall, <laughs> there wasn't any really uh, any case that I would have found. I mean, it would have been easy enough to escape out of it, but uh, landing in the jungles or in the in the mountains, I don't, I don't, I, I, I take that back. As I, I, that's 50 years ago, so pardon my lack of memory. Uh, we had the small chest packs that you could snap onto a harness, and we did wear the harness during flight. Okay. So we did have them available to well, us. I was curious about that because my next question was, you know, were you fired on at any time while you were flying these missions? Yes. Uh, there were two occasions that I know of that I was fired on. Uh, and one occasion, we were flying in an area up over the highlands uh, in Central at night. And I detected my view out of the cockpit, I saw a flash in the, in the distance, which appeared to be about uh, the same height I was, maybe a half a mile, it's hard to say if they're a single point, but a half a mile or so away. Not enough that I could feel a concussion, but uh, uh, we watched that a couple of times and we decided to exit the area and work another part of the territory and we came back later in that mission and we were, we were able to see, you know, 50 miles or more at night, clear conditions. And we didn't detect any flashing in our absence, but when we came back, we saw it again. So they were apparently shooting at our sound and they were shooting at some distance away from us. Because at that time, they didn't have any radar guidance on their artillery. Uh, the other time uh, I was on the final approach into Nha Trang landing from over the sea, and there were mountains on either side and, and a large bay that we were on on the final approach path. And as I came down final approach, all of a sudden I saw tracers coming up from either side over across the nose of the aircraft at a distance of maybe 100 yards in front of us. And of course, at that point, we didn't suspect anything. We're, so we were flying a normal approach pattern with all the lights on, landing lights and everything else. And we turned all those off and reported the sighting as we went around and came back the second time. And uh, we didn't see any gunfire the second time. That, we, cl that close to your landing right, base. Right. Yeah, but we did get an intelligence report the next day that the uh, 
the sea patrols had gone out and had captured a couple of armed sampans that were enemy. I so see. they got the guys. Uh, good, good. Uh, it's interesting uh, to me that one of the things about that uh, tour of duty in Vietnam for me as a flyer was that over the south, which we were, we never flew over the north part of any part of the DMZ or above it, but over South Vietnam, the Air Force or the U.S. had total air superiority. There was never any enemy aircraft other than maybe an occasional dart that occurred up near the DMZ. So we had no, no concern for our own safety from that. Mm -hmm. And our biggest uh, concern for safety was being shot down by our own forces or, or uh, running into mid-air collisions because there was no air traffic control and no radar guidance mm -hmm. flying in and out of the clouds or being shot at by the U.S. Navy or flying through the path of their artillery, I should say, more accurately. They weren't misidentifying, they just weren't aware of our presence. And on one occasion when I was flying over uh, Laos, uh, we were bombed by a B-52. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> excuse me, that's an interesting story because we were under the control of an airborne command post, which was a C-130 that was a acting as a communications link. And uh, we had reported in and he'd reported that there was no uh, activity in our area. And as I was flying along at uh, 8,000 feet, give or take, uh, all of a sudden I felt this boom, boom, boom. And I looked out the left side and I saw these concussions going off. You've seen pictures of those where you see the shock wave coming out from, from that but they were hitting about one every 10 seconds or less. Boom, boom. And it was about half a mile off my left wing. And, and, and so we, we turned right and exited the area and I talked to the command post and they, uh, I asked them why they hadn't advised us and they said, oh, uh, there was a B-52 that couldn't get to his prime target so use a target of opportunity. Well, he was so high that we couldn't see him we were so low and camouflaged on the top of the airplane, so he obviously couldn't see us. So it was just one of those potentials. That <laughs> <laughs> and you and he, he was carrying a, a typical 105 pound, I mean 105 bomb load of 500 pound bombs. And when they salvo those in a string like that, it's one bomb every okay. 10 seconds for 105 bombs, so you can figure out how long it lasts. It goes on for quite a ways and it's just a boom, 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 boom. So on you actually- Making didn't... water holes, as they <laughs> said. <laughs> um, yeah, we peeled off and got out of the way. So he's actually just getting rid of, rid of his bomb load, really. Yeah. There was no real target. There was no real target there. No. Yeah. At, uh... Another time I was flying down the coast of Vietnam and was, uh, saw a big boat off to my left wing. I was coast is on, on the right and I'm a half a mile offshore or more or less lying feet wet as they call it. And uh, I'd asked the radar controller that I was in contact with if they had any naval artillery along the coast and they said negative. And I saw this big boat down there and I, I flew down between it and the sh shoreline. And uh, as I r got close to it, I kind of and banked over to the left so I could get a better look at it. And as I looked down, I got the muzzle blast of three eight-inch guns, which looked like they were pointed right at me. And their artillery was landing about a mile and a half onshore, right. which meant it was coming up through our altitude and going back down the other right. side. It was the uh, cruiser Vincennes. Oh, the Vincennes, I had yes. identified it later yeah. in my research as to what was active there in Vietnam during that time frame. Yes, a well-known cruiser yes. in Vincennes, yes. It, it obviously was a different one than the one that was involved with the Hornets. Yes. Uh, but it was later vintage. Yeah. I think it was a 111 was the, the hull number on oh, it. Okay. It was reported. Anyway. Uh, the, the original Vincennes escorted our friend Tom Griffin on the Doolittle Raid. Right. Yeah. It was, uh, the interesting thing about that is I had checked in again, as I said, with the the uh, radar site as we flew through his area and he said he had na no naval firing and I reported back to him immediately <laughs> that he was wrong. 
And uh, about five minutes later, I heard another aircraft call him with the same question, and he got the same answer, negative artillery firing. And I had given them an idea where the, the uh, shells were impacting, so they have some way to know where, uh, where the firing direction and height might be. And he reported back to me, he said, well, he said, you were not, were not an authenticated source, so we couldn't relay their, that information you gave us to anybody else. So I said, okay, fine, and I called the other aircraft air to air and told them, if you see a big boat, don't go between the boat and the shore, because you might get shot at <laughs> inadvertently. Yes. Oh, my God. One of the foibles of war. Yes. Yeah. So um, how long were you uh, with the uh, EC-47 there in Vietnam then? You went there in 67. Right. Right. I ferried, the, the ferry mission was in the, uh, the Janu uh, February and March time frame of uh, 1967, and I left there right after the Tet invasion in uh, 1968, which was in February of 68. Yes. And during that time I flew 107 missions, I believe, yeah, 107 missions in just a tad under a thousand hours. We were flying every other, every other day, in, in essence, while we were there, and as they say, seven to eight hour missions. So you were there um, about a year mm -hmm. and flew, yes. and, and, and you flew in uh, 365 days, you flew 107, yes. uh, and I'll call them the com what they are, combat missions. They were combat reconnaissance missions, unarmed. So you're going out every three days, four days at the most. Yeah, we'd, we'd typically fly every, well, two days on, one day off, two days on, one, way, one day off. I see. There were a few side operations that we had, including some time off, you know, R&R &R and that type of thing. Right. <coughs> but uh, during, that, during that time period, uh, during the rules that were applied at the time that when you went to Vietnam, an assignment was defined as a limited by one year, and the clock started when we left the continental United States on the ferry flight. So the first, we got the credit for about two and a half weeks of combat time while we're still making our way across the Pacific. I see. Um, are you still a captain at this time in the, of the Tet yes. Offensive? Yes, I was. I see. And. Um, now, are you reassigned after the Tet Offensive? Offensive. Uh, my tour of duty was up in that time period, and I was in contact with the Air Force Personnel Center on what I might have as a reassignment. And uh, they naturally came back with three choice assignments. All of them were in C-47s because that's where I had my time and experience. And I responded back to them that I thought I'd probably, as much as I enjoyed the experiences I'd had flying this bird, I had trained in jets and I thought it was time for me to go into something more modern. And I declined going to Libya and I declined to going down to Florida training the uh, troops that were going to be flying over in, in subsequent C-47 operations. And it's one of those classic situations, I had a, a top secret clearance, which takes several months to accomplish. I had that for the EC-47 mission. And so I, when I talked to the people at the personnel center and asked me what my preferences were, and I said, well, I'd kind of be interested in flying KC-135 KC or something of that type in SAC or, or other limited ones that there were, and I don't know the process, but obviously uh, the fact that I had a top secret clearance that was active made me a prime candidate to go to the KC-135 program, which was supporting the brand new SR-71 aircraft. And one of the guys in the, the squadron had come from Beale Air Force Base and he said, oh, if you're looking for a KC-135, you want to go to Beale Air Force Base because that's where the SR-71 is. 
So I used a little negative psychology on them in SAC headquarters, I thought. They had three bases in California with KC-135s, and I told them to deal with my third choice. And that's the one I got. <laughs> and of course, the others didn't require top secret clearance, so I had a top secret clearance already, so that saved them six months of you know, running, finding somebody else that didn't have one for yeah. the assignment. So I entered SAC at that point. And this is uh, what point, what time? This, this was in the summer of 1968, and I went straight to Castle Air Force Base, which was the SAC transition base for people coming into the 135 that had not been in it before. And because of the fact that at that point in time I had uh, 2,500 hours of total flying time, I had a Vietnam assignment behind me, a combat assignment behind me, and all that, excuse me, they put me right into aircraft commander's training, left seat, without ever going through the, the normal training procedure of co-pilot. So I had, uh, had the opportunity after going through that training program, which was about two months, two and a half months in length, of going just up the road an hour and a half to uh, Beale Air Force Base, which is north of, uh, of Sacramento, and uh, checking in there. And when I got to, to my squadron, uh, I was card carrying qualified KC-135 aircraft commander, but I'd never done any of the SAC operations, and certainly not the SR-71 operations. So I was assigned to a crew that had an instructor pilot and an instructor navigator on board. And so I got to fly for six months or eight months in both seats because the instructor pilot could instruct me and maintain control of the airplane if I didn't quite perform properly. And so I got a, a good exposure to that. Now that's a KC-135? Yes. And what is that? Well, it's, it's a tanker airplane, and this is, this is the assignment that I was dealing with. It's a KC-135 Q model, Q meaning that it was configured with special fuel tanks and electronics equipment for marrying up with the SR-71 aircraft. And we have a, a model here of the SR-71. Uh, are you... Not just a question, you're familiar with the, uh, the SR-71, aren't you? Oh yes, very yeah. much so. Um, tell us about this plane, if you would, before we sure. go into the KC-135. One of the things I was not aware of at the time, uh, I, you know, I had a kind of an idea that the SR-71 had been around for a while, and what I've come to find out subsequently is that the SR-71 had only gone operational with the Air Force under SAC operations less than a year before I entered the flight operations with them at Beale. The significance of that is, number one, the reason for that is the airplane was originally designed as a single-seat aircraft for the CIA. It was modified to a, a dual-cockpit aircraft to put a, a systems operator behind the pilot, which was the SR-71 configuration, and then it was transferred out of CIA control into SAC control. Uh, so at the time I got into it, they were still cutting their teeth on some of the procedures and tactics and everything was new, you know, to, to the operation. And they had flown their first operational sortie, which was to Okinawa operating over Southeast Asia at a period of time that was less than six months from the time that I arrived in the squadron. And I wasn't aware of that because I, they didn't give me all that background. Mm -hmm. Didn't have a need to know. I just had a need to know you know, what, what I was specifically doing with the KC-135. But the tactics were all unique and different. Uh, if you can imagine this particular aircraft, the SR-71, uh, held the record of being the highest flying, fastest flying, operational, air-breathing aircraft at the time, and it holds that record to this day even though it's been retired since 1998 from service for almost 20 years. This plane actually is rated at Mach 3.2? 3.5. 3, uh, 3. 3 plus. plus. And in talking to the pilots, uh, they don't really know how fast further it could go beyond that point because they're in that 
for portion of the envelope, they're flying so fast and so high that if they go a little bit faster in, under certain circumstances, they, get, they go beyond the point that they get too much heat on the airplane, and if they slow down any, they stall. <laughs> you know, they're right up in what they call Coffin's Corner. So they flew the airplane to the limit, and uh, I don't know that they ever uh, publicly acknowledged, or if they ever did, fly it stratospherically like they did the F-104 where they actually flew it into a parabolic arc and just launched it like a rocket ship mm -hmm. until it flamed out and then they'd come back, back down. So I don't know how high it could really go. But it was limited in speed by the temperature on the skin and on the engine inlets. And it's a, it's a fantastic machine and uh, it was retired in 98 because it costs so much to fly it. But can still do things that satellites can't do, <laughs> which was what replaced it. And that is that satellites, everybody knows where the satellite's going to be when it goes around because it's orbital in nature. Right. And the SR-71 could show up all of a sudden without any advance warning over any place in the, in the world, literally, with refueling. So it, it has some very, very unique capability. When it started out, uh, it was doing photo reconnaissance with the Brownie camera, we called it, with a lens about that big around, about the size of a baseball, uh, basketball. And I've seen the photographs and you could actually tell ground forces taken from 85,000 feet, which ones had helmets on and which ones were bareheaded. The resolution was so, so Precise. great in clear weather. And oh. it also had side looking radar and, and other forms of down looking radar. It had no forward looking radar. So it couldn't avoid weather. And they had one incident during the time that I was flying with them that on a mission that I was on, but not in my refueling portion of it. But uh, they had come off the refueling boom full of fuel, which meant they were heavy. They departed the refueling at from 26,000 feet and were climbing back to 85,000 feet. And they saw a thunderstorm right on their direct path of flight. And they decided they couldn't veer around it because that would take them off the required flight path that was computer controlled so they would know exactly where the airplane was at. And so they tried to outclimb it and they failed to do so. And as they pulled it higher and higher to do that, it got to the point that it the airplane ran out of airspeed. And if I may, uh, from the fuselage, you can see where the wings are on the airplane. But we've got the broad chines, which are also lift surfaces on either side, these, these things that I'm showing you. And when it stalls, it falls tail first. And of course, to recover from a stall, you have to put the nose down and get it flying again. And they had no method to do that because the wings here were stalled. And of course, when it stalled, the engines flamed out as well. So the crew uh, took the nylon elevator down. They punched out of the airplane at supersonic speed. They wore a Mercury astronaut type of flight suit and helmet because the airplane cockpit was not pressurized or only partially pressurized. They went out at supersonic speed. They landed in a rice paddy near Utapau in Thailand. And the two crew members, uninjured, got tucked their space helmets underneath their arm, walked up to the road, flagged down a bot bus. That's one of those tricycle type of uh, taxi cabs they had, Cushman motor scooter type, and got a ride to the main gate of Utapau Air Force Base, which was a SAC base, and then, then to the command post. <laughs> what a story that is. And they picked up the telephone. This is a true story. They picked up the telephone in the command post. They called from that command post to the command post in Beale Air Force Base and had a phone patch to their homes, their families, and said, honey, if you hear the SR-71 went down, don't worry about it. We're, we're safe. <laughs> My God. When we got back on the ground, we were three hours between his... Uh, refueling times and so on, but we were aware he was doing the second refueling after we had refueled him about another thousand miles or so down track. <laughs> and, and, uh, but at any rate, we got back on the ground 
at, at uh, Okinawa, and we were met by security people, and they told us that if we made any mention of that airplane being lost by SR-71 type being lost over Southeast Asia, that we would, under the Official Secrets Act, we would go to prison, no trial, $10,000 fine, and that you know, leak, leaking secrets. And we got back on the base at, at uh, so you're landing at Kadena? We landed back at Kadena in Okinawa, yeah. Okay. And then come to find out that when we're sworn to secrecy, they had called all the way back and told their families that they were okay. <laughs> and that went all over Beale Air Force Base, just yeah. like, like yeah. going viral, as they say now. Yeah. Wow, um, what a story that is. Yeah. My goodness, those two guys, you talk about miraculous. Yeah. Oh. Well, during the time that I flew with the SR-71 operations, they lost one-third of their fleet of SR-71s. There were 35 of them, 33 of them made uh, for operational use, and uh, they lost one-third of that number in that, that five-year time period. And they had no fatalities, no crew fatalities. Is that right? Yeah. And lost a third. Now, the, the airplane was so sensitive one of the one of the situations that occurred that they had a their approach and landing is done on angle of attack angle of approach and not on not so much on airspeed and they had an instrument uh, artificial horizon that was about seven six seven inches in diameter right in the middle of the cockpit mm -hmm. and that was driven by one of the main electrical systems and they had a backup one there was a little small one, maybe about two inches in diameter that was over in the side of the cockpit. But the, the little one, the backup uh, attitude indicator was not sufficiently large and sensitive that they could land the airplane on that instrument. And if they had an engine flame out and lost the primary electrical system on it and that center one went out, it was almost a built-in crash I see. at the time. So. Uh, they had a couple that were lost from that type of situations. Uh, they had a couple of them that were lost uh, that were aircraft was encountered high winds or other conditions and went off the side of the runway. They had one that w was crashed on takeoff because the airplane inadvertently had exceeded the maximum RPM design of the wheels on the landing gear because it it was a hot and heavy day, and uh, the wheel, one or more of the wheels like, disintegrated during the takeoff. And mm -hmm. the sparks and flame from that failed wheel and the shrapnel punctured the fuel tanks and lit the fuel on fire, and the pilot was notified that the, the uh, airplane was burning, and it was, he was already exceeded his takeoff uh, limit point and he opted, even though he knew that he was going to, not going to be able to abort within the confines of the runway, that he didn't want to be in the air in that condition. He wanted to be on the ground. So he put it back on the ground. They went off the end of the runway. The landing gear collapsed when they went over a culvert. And they came to rest with this trail of flame running down the runway, catching up with them. And uh, the pilot opened the canopy the back end observer in the normal crew procedure had to eject prior to the pilot ejecting, otherwise he would have been blasted by the pilot's ejection seat. So he didn't know what was going on. He punched out on the ground after the vehicle had stopped. The pilot opened the canopy and jumped over the rail and they ran away and neither one of them was, was seriously injured. Wow. <laughs> Interesting stories. You're not kidding. Um, well, if you would now, e explain um, the KC-135 for us. Okay. And your, your refueling procedures. Um, in other words, you know, the flight, the speed, the altitudes that you might re refuel at. Okay. The, the whole procedure, if you would. Sure. The, the the thing that's unique about it uh, in this particular case is you're marrying up a supersonic aircraft that's designed to fly, fly very fast 
with a subsonic aircraft that, that can't exceed the speed of sound. In fact, we're, our limiting Mach number typically was 0.87 Mach, 87% of the speed of sound. Our normal cruise was 0.81 to 0.82 Mach. Uh, That's 500 and some miles an hour. Yes, then, at in, in terms points. of ground speed, right. Yeah. Uh, if you look at this picture closely, you'll notice the angle of attack, the pitch angle, the, the tanker is flying fairly level body where the SR-71 is b a bit nose up. And, and that's what was typical of about middle of the refueling track. Because during the refueling, the tanker is passing upwards of 80,000 pounds of fuel to the SR-71. So the tanker's getting lighter and the SR-71 is getting heavier. And another interesting aside to that is if we didn't do the procedure correctly and, and maintain our accelerated speed during the refueling, he would have to, as he got heavier, his pitch would be, get higher and get more drag, and in order to stay on the boom in contact with the tanker, he'd have to go into afterburners. And if he went into afterburners at that point, he would be burning fuel faster than we could pass it to him. So that said, our normal procedure was we would orbit when we're gonna refuel him uh, we would orbit at uh, 27,000 feet of altitude. We'd have a block of airspace above us and below us by about 2,000 feet each way so that we'd have maneuvering room for separation from other air traffic protection. Uh, he would enter the airspace, come up behind us, whether he had descended from high altitude or coming up from the ground. Uh, he would come up behind us. At that point, we would be operating at, at a most economical cruise speed for the tanker. As he approached it within a half a mile, we would do a maneuver called accelerate, uh, uh, descend and accelerate. He would be at a thousand feet below us and we would do a gentle descent uh, as he was coming behind a place behind us, which was causing our aircraft to increase their speed by about 10 to 15 knots from what we had initially been orbiting at. Uh, we would orbit at 250 knots. We'd accelerate 270 knots, and that's indicated airspeed. And when he would get to within half a mile, he would hold position until he was cleared to come onto contact. Then he'd move forward and, and uh, plug in. And if you'll notice also that the, uh, the boom is well behind the cockpit. So he's not seeing anything relative to where the boom is. All he's using is the bottom of the airplane, the bottom of the tanker is his reference points. And the KC-135 had some pilot direction lights along the belly that were a row straight uh, along the fuselage and also side to side that could give additional cues as to help the receiver pilot position himself by reference to those lights and you know, when he was in the right position. Uh, once the, once the uh, SR-71 came into contact, we would then slowly and, and smoothly accelerate with the KC-135 with him in, in contact. And by the end of the refueling track, we had increased our speed from 0.84 to 0.87 Mach. That way he was at, at flying speed without using afterburners. Uh, another aspect of this, the only time we, you had a situation like you see here with a single tanker was in training operations. Uh, we always had one spare tanker more than necessary, which meant that the refuelings that were done close to takeoff point with a two ship formation the ones that are further down track, in other words, when we was flying between Okinawa and Vietnam, for example, uh, the tankers might have already been flying for two hours or three hours before he got there, and they're burning off their fuel. So in that case, we'd have to do a split tanker. He'd have to take half of his load from the first tanker and then move over to the second tanker. And then we had the third one as a spare. So there was a lot of man manipulating and maneuvering so that the Spare tanker was already in the position to be the next one on the right. 
I'd this, probably confuse that to, for many of you you're thinking, but well, what it's we, almost like being a ballerina at 20, 28,000 20, feet, yeah. feet in the air. Yeah. Uh, so it has to be so per precise. Yes. You have a, we didn't ask you about the number of crew members on, on this KC-135. We had four. Four. Pilot, co-pilot, navigator, and a and boom, boom operator. operator. And the boom operator did double duty as a flight engineer. Okay. Uh, now the boom operator is normally an enlisted man. Yeah, he was an enlisted man that was very proud to go around the Air Force and tell everybody that he was a, a sergeant that, that had three officers working for him so that he could lay on his belly and pass gas. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh. Uh, another facet of this that was unique was that when the SR-71 finished taking a top-off load when he was at full weight, he was so far behind the power curve, that is, he was so slow for his weight that the only way that he could do anything was after he disconnected, he would do a dipsy doodle maneuver, as they called it, which meant that he'd back off a little bit, drop the nose, and descend for up to 4,000 feet to get his speed back up so then he could pull out and climb and go supersonic and climb up to his 85,000 feet altitude. Another interesting aspect of that was the SR-71, partly as a result of that accident that I told you about the wheel disintegrating, they were limited after that accident uh, investigation to a lower maximum fuel weight at takeoff. And at that lower fuel weight, uh, he basically could, he had enough fuel on board that he could take off and climb in, in a normal manner to 27,000 foot altitude. And then he had about 30 minutes at that point before he had to return to where he took off from if he didn't have gas. So he was always getting a top off as soon as he got to 27,000 feet. There was a pair of tankers waiting for him or he would have to board and go home. Un the, the under normal conditions, how long did it take you to hook up with the SR-71? Uh, well, there's two ways to answer that. Uh, you're talking about the physical connection? Yes, sir. Uh, making the physical connection from the time that he reported at a half a mile behind us to being in contact uh, was probably no more than three to four minutes. Is that right? Yeah. But when we're flying like that uh, in, in this type of formation, the rate of closure is very, very gradual. It, I mean, the mm -hmm. airplanes are so close to a match that a mile or a couple of knots of speed it will go a long way. <laughs> so it, it, it doesn't appear to be anything that's haphazard or rapid. But what the question I thought you were asking was how long does it take to refuel them? Our goal was always to, to have him at full tanks at the designated drop-off point. So sometimes they ride along with not taking very much fuel, still in contact, so that they would know what their fuel was going to be based on their desired drop-off point. But a capacity of the tanker was such as that we could pass uh, the, the uh, 80,000 pounds of, of fuel within uh, about le less than 10 minutes. Is that right? So with a, with a large aircraft, you could do that. I see. Uh, Another facet of that that made it very challenging was that if he was doing a refueling from hot and fast, coming down from high altitude, he was had a very precise flight pattern that he would have to have predetermined by his onboard computers as to when to start that descent, because he had no speed brakes on that airplane. And the last thing in the world he'd want to do was end up down at our altitude or below our altitude by a thousand feet and be ahead of us. Because the only way it could get behind us, in a practical sense, you might say this to slow down, let us catch up, but he was too close to stall already. So he would have to do a 360 and come back around, which mm -hmm. would take a lot more fuel and a lot more time. So they had some very uh, precise procedures they do. They would, they would try to be at their thousand foot below our altitude at a distance of about two to five miles. Sometimes it's closer to two, sometimes not. But uh, that was uh, another factor that, that uh, really made the prospect and operation very difficult for him. 
The other thing that is unique about it is in the normal SAC operating procedures with tankers and receivers was in their refueling formation for a B-52 or even for fighters, a, a pair or a flight of three or four tankers would normally space out at a mile distance from each other, 500 feet separation in altitude and, and, and out at, at about uh, maybe 30 degrees behind each airplane in the national line, 30 degrees behind on an angle. With the SR-71, because of the, the uh, cockpit arrangement, I don't know, it's pretty hard to see that on that, but he had very limited visibility uh, from his cockpit window to the side. So uh, if he were to, if the tankers were to be positioned like that, uh, you know, with 30 degree echelon and, and a mile or a mile and a half behind, he would have to pull off throttle, let it slide way back. And then when he, once he could see in his peripheral vision the, the other tanker that he's going to slide over, and that would, would be a very, very long process. So we flew uh, in this formation when we were flying the next one to take fuel, we were in almost wingtips overlap with the two tankers. And it was amazing to me because the only formation training I'd had was in pilot training with very small airplanes. But the KC-135 was a beautiful airplane to fly close formation because it was a very stable platform. It just, you had to take into account the fact that you had a lot more momentum. And so you had to really finesse it on and seeing the very first indication of movement. And of course, the closer you are in formation, the easier it is to do that. What, um, tell us a little more about the KC-135 now then. Um, how many uh, jet engines did it have and um, okay. the fuel capacity, the range? Uh, and you, you were flying out of Beale. Right and uh, your missions would take you all the way to Okinawa and back? Uh, no, we would, we would deploy from Beale to Okinawa for six weeks at a time. I see. Six weeks there, 12 weeks at home, six weeks there, 12 weeks at home for five years. <laughs> for five years. <laughs> five years, yeah. Uh, back to your question, it, uh, this was, except for the unique uh, tank isolation for the two different types of fuels, and the electronics on board, this was the original KC-135 configuration, which is a 1957, essentially, aircraft. And we still had, on our airplanes, the turbojet engines. By turbojet, that means that all of, the, all of the exhaust coming out the back end is the same that comes into the front end, and it all goes through the, the uh, hot section of the engine and is heated. Uh, as a result, it's early technology. In order to maintain necessary uh, thrust over hot and cold, high and low uh, conditions for takeoffs, they had to use water injection to get the engines, add mass to the engines under hot conditions or high altitude fields in order to uh, get enough thrust to get the airplane airborne. The later models have been uh, subsequently re-engined with fan engines of one size or another, small, small bypass or large bypass. But we had the original type, so we were uh, power limited. The airplane had an operation empty weight of about a hundred, a little over a hundred thousand, say 105,000 pounds. And our maximum takeoff gross weight was 300,000 pounds. So we could carry 200,000 pounds of fuel, rounded off. I see. And that 200,000 pounds of fuel Again, depending on high or low, where more efficient altitudes, airspeeds, and so on, uh, that gave the airplane a range of uh, in excess of 3,000 miles without refueling. The KC 135. What was the civilian um, counterpart to this uh, KC 135? The KC 135 was the, the original aircraft that was developed by Boeing. And the civilian counterpart, which was largely the first ones were built on Air Force tooling, was the Boeing 707. I see. And also the 720, which was uh, closest to the size of the, seven of the, of the uh, KC-135. The commercials very quickly converted to the fan engines. Air Force, for configuration management, 
situation held everything, and they typically do that. They hold the design at the initial state because there's so many more involved and they've got to be man maintaining all the supplies for them and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the difference being their structural differences, the KC-135, same size 707, had a 250,000 pound or initially 225,000 pound maximum gross mm -hmm. weight where we had a 302,000. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course the KC-135 has no side windows in it, a couple little portholes, but they don't have passenger windows. And they're, they're bare airplane inside. If you've never been in a tanker, you might have a, a, an envision that it's a flying tank, which it is. But you go out and look at the airplane and it's a cargo airplane and the whole, whole interior it is a cargo shell. All the fuel is in the wings and in the belly because <laughs> right. fuel is heavy. Yeah, I flew in the uh, KB-50. Uh, I started to say 29 yeah. because it's basically the same thing, but the right. KB-50, yeah, you know, for profit engines. Right. Uh, but uh, so these missions that you were uh, flying at this time while you're in SAC. Could we cut it there for a minute while I take a pit stop? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're back for part two of, of our interview with uh, Colonel Miller. Um, a question I have, uh, Colonel Miller, is what uh, these missions that you were flying in 1968 in the KC-135, uh, what was the purpose of these missions that you were flying and you were stopping at Kadena, but of course I imagine the SR-71 was going on further. Right. Well, my, my job there was twofold, and I'll address the first part. The, the missions that we were flying on uh, were the operational missions, but they also included some training missions with the SR-71 back at Beale. The, the meat and potatoes part of it was the part we were doing o in Okinawa for the most part. Uh, the Okinawa missions were during the time frame of the Vietnamese War and the SR-71 was flying missions uh, over that entire theater area. And again, part of the capability of the airplane was such that he, at 85,000 feet, that's 15 miles <laughs> above the surface, at that altitude and airspeed, when he wanted to change course, if he rolled into a normal bank to reverse course 180 degrees, uh, in that course of time, it, you know, he's got a camera looking off at a, an angle which is able to see 200 or 300 miles away from where he position he's over. So among other things, he could fly along the, the border of China and roll into a bank, make a turn, and be able to see up into, the, into China or into Cambodia or in Lower Laos or any other area that he's flying over. And it's a long, it's, it takes a long time and a very large radius of space to turn an airplane at that speed at that altitude. Mm -hmm. So he's, as I said, at that time frame, he was doing mostly uh, photography. Uh, film strips that had to right. be developed when we when he got back home and then processed and then analyzed and so on. Uh, in, a, in addition to what he was doing, and I have no specific knowledge of any of the targets he was looking at, but he was looking at a good part of the hemisphere from where he's looking mm -hmm. from. Uh, but in, in addition to uh, that activity, he obviously was refueling in the case of, of uh, the trip to Okinawa, uh, excuse me, from Okinawa to over, over Southeast Asia, which was about a five, five and a half hour mission for him, uh, it required multiple refuelings by the tanker force to get him there. And uh, as I was saying before, it would take two tankers to top him off at the top of his climb after takeoff. And then every subsequent refueling, which was further down track, so to speak, there would have to be a, a, a formation of tankers, three tankers, 
two refuelers and a spare uh, to make a split offload because the tankers are going to have to fly for several hours taking off from the same place mm -hmm. to be there when he gets there. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the mission profile of it during that time frame, a mission from Okinawa to over Southeast Asia and landing back in Okinawa for the SR-71 would involve three refuelings, which would take 10 tankers. And the extra ones, if you're doing the math, two right. plus three plus three, the extra ones are the fact that we had an air spare flying just off of Okinawa at altitude with a full load of fuel for him so that they could intercept him anywhere along his path coming home. If he had to, for example, if he had an engine problem, he had to descend and come down lower and thus burn more fuel. Uh, we also had uh, a tanker standing on, the, on, by, uh, on standby on the ground with engines running every time a cell of two or three tankers launched over the course of the mission. Mm -hmm. So it was very resource intensive, and there were many, many issues about that which ultimately caused the demise of the SR-71 as being not cost effective or being too, co too costly to uh, operate in the environment of uh, getting budgets getting smaller and smaller. Uh, the second part of the mission, and I'll elaborate more on that first one if you have more questions, but the second part of what my job was during the time at Beale was as I made pr progress through the s system in SAC, was I was elevated ultimately to being instructor pilot and doing the training of the KC-135 crews from the standpoint of upgrading. And in the normal uh, run of the mission in, within SAC, most before my time with them, before the Vietnam War, most of the normal crew progression for pilots was that they would graduate from pilot training and go immediately to SAC and they would, in their signed aircraft, B-52, 135, whatever, they would sit in the right seat for years learning the duties of the co-pilot and the duties of the operation and all the things that are going on in that. And it's years because more time was spent sitting on alert than actually flying airplanes. But anyway, it, it would take, uh, two to five years probably and at best for a co-pilot to get enough flying time and enough experience to be eligible to be upgraded to aircraft commander. So that was my role uh, in part of that process was upgrading co-pilots to aircraft commanders and also upgrading aircraft commanders to instructor pilot status if they were qualified and, and interested and so on. And so uh, toward the latter part of my five years with SAC, uh, I ended up being, without a crew of my own, I was ended up as an instructor pilot and was just training with another crew for the purpose of upgrading their pilot, their co-pilot, or what have you. Mm -hmm. So back to the SR-71 mission, you know, their, their primary mission was to provide the Okinawa to Vietnam was a, a portion of the worldwide coverage. They were also doing reconnaissance missions over Europe and over other parts of the world in times of hot spots and mm -hmm. Cuban missiles and all that. One of the unique characteristics of the SR-71, it flew so high and it flew so fast that there wasn't anything could catch it to shoot it down. Right. However, as things got more and more sophisticated, uh, the SR-71 was an airplane, amazingly, it was designed in a time period where they didn't have computers to do that type of work. So they were designed with slide rules in the skunk works, <laughs> you know, in Lockheed Skunk Works. Mm -hmm. And they were designed in a period of about three years as compared to what it takes now, 20 years, to, to field a new aircraft because mm -hmm. of all the, all the controls and all that kind of stuff. Right. But at any rate, uh, one of the things reverting back to the capabilities of the SR-71, somewhere along the way during the time that I was flying with them, there was some studies done and they decided, well, now we've got the computers, what could we have designed that airplane to look like to do what that airplane does? And when they went through that in terms of just pure making something equal to it, 
they ran the, the computer design programs and all that sophisticated stuff, and they came out with a, an airplane that looked just exactly like the MiG-23 Foxbat. Oh, the MiG, oh, is that right? Now, the interesting part about that story is you can't catch one of these things with an equal. You've got to have something that can perform better than that, <laughs> and it couldn't do it. But they did get more sophistication, ultimately. They, part of the problem they found also in trying to shoot it down from the ground, like they did, did Gary Powers, uh, Francis Gary Powers in the U-2, was that the airplane in that case was very high, 65,000 foot, but it flew very slow relative to Mach number. It was subsonic airplane. And you could get a missile lock on, and the missile could lock it and track it and be shot at it and catch it. Mm -hmm. With this thing, SR-71, it was going so fast that before they'd get the missile launch into a launch mode, the SR-71 was gone. Gone, right. So the only way they could catch it with a ground missile was if they had capability like the internet or something similar to it where they could have several radar sites along the path that it was projected to be on and could project yeah. where it was going to be when it was way out of sight of the first one and, and pass those to this hand on and they, did, they didn't have that technology. Now I've seen a photograph and I've talked to the pilots that saw the photographs <laughs> of it as well of the, the, the uh, can't remember the designation, but the, the standard air-to-air -air or ground-to-air missile, anti-aircraft missile, shot at the SR-71. It looked like a telephone pole coming up at him and it was tumbling when it was within a thousand feet of the belly of the SR-71. But it reached the point it ran out of airspeed and altitude right. and controllability. So mm. they were trying to get them, but yeah. they, they didn't have any success with it. And that's one of the things that made it very successful. As an aside on your experiences, did you refuel other aircraft while in SAC besides the SR-71? Yes. Uh, my mission, the squadron I was with, was the sole squadron that supported the SR-71 initially. They brought in a second squadron to support it, but their aircraft were not fully modified with all of the electronics equipment, the mm -hmm. rendezvous equipment and communications. But at time to time, we spent a portion of our time doing conventional refueling, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I've refueled B-52s, C-5s, F-4s, the, the entire gamut, even the F-117 when it was coming on board. You didn't tell us what squadron you were in. I was in the 903rd Air Refueling Squadron at Beale. Okay. During the time I was there, they established a second squadron that was the 9th Aerial Refueling Squadron, and they restructured the command line so that instead of being the 903rd instead of being under the 456th bomb wing, which was the parent B-52 mm -hmm. wing on, on the base at Beale, they formed the 9th Strategic Wing, which included the SR-71, the 9th Refueling Squadron, and the 903rd Squadron. 903rd. That all happened after I left, so I may not have those, accurate, those details yeah. accurate. But while you were there, you were in the 903rd. The 903rd. Refueling right. Squadron, I see. That was using the standard SAC designation. The interesting thing about that aspect was that it required a special top secret clearance to be involved with that. Mm -hmm. And any of the, the audience that's watching this has seen probably many movies about SAC ORIs, operational readiness inspections, and, and head, higher headquarters inspections and so on. We weren't vulnerable to that because the members, the players at, at that time at SAC headquarters didn't have the top secret clearance. So they couldn't come in and inspect us. We were a free cannon <laughs> to operate whatever it took to get this airplane where it needed to be. And it was, it was nice. Uh, in the five years that I spent in SAC, I pulled alert one time. <laughs> Is that right? One time. <laughs> that, um, that was required to be at SAC Aircraft Commander when you had to be familiar with the alert procedures. Yes. Um, well, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, you were, were, had you been promoted though while you were still uh, with the 903rd? Yes. yes. To uh, uh, major? To major. To major. Yeah. There, there's a, an interesting aside on a story on that if you would like me to sure. elaborate on it. Uh, as a result of, of uh, my progression through my uh, time in SAC, I had been recently 
upgraded as a captain to instructor pilot. And uh, I was at Okinawa on one of those six week tours of duty. It was the first one, in fact, that I was the aircraft commander on uh, the crew myself. And I was in a day of crew rest, meaning that I was not on the schedule to fly, and I got a phone call from the uh, bomb wing who had the administrative control over the entire uh, tanker fleet there. The SR-71 tankers had their separate command post. So we were kind of autonomous, but we were still under their umbrella. And I got this phone call and they said, uh, you're to report with your crew for a mission taking off at such and so time the next morning. And I said, I think you may have the wrong Captain Miller. And he said, no, we know who you are and, and where you're from, you're, that you're from the SR-71 operations, but you're the only IP available instructor pilot. And uh, we've got a special mission that needs to be flown and you've been designated to do it. So, okay. Well, I took my, my crew over for the briefing and I was informed that we had a, we were on a special mission to Seoul, Korea to, to take a Code 3 passenger, VIP. Now, Code 3 means it was an ambassadorial level position. They didn't know who the ambassador was, they didn't know anything about it, but they knew that that was what the tasking was, and I was to do that. So, okay, I briefed, took the briefing and, and uh, prepared to do the job. They said the, the, the uh, Code 3 VIP will arrive at the aircraft just prior to engine start, so you go do what you need to do. So, but uh, you've flown Ray and Sachs, so you, you have a little insight into how it was under the LeMay era, and I was at the tail end of that. Uh, everything was command and control, everything controlled through the command post and all this kind of thing. And they told me that uh, once you get up uh, to, prior to landing in, at Seoul, because it's a shorter than normal SAC runway and it's winter time and there's some uh, weather conditions and potential for snow and so on and so forth, you must check back with our command post here in Okinawa by high frequency HF radio or by whatever other means and get authorization to land. And uh, I, I was puzzled a little bit by that and I said, well, why do I need to have that? Well, there's a question about the, the weather conditions and so on and I said, yeah, I, I understand that, but, but I can make that determination it is ultimately my responsibility to do that. Uh, they said, well, if, if the weather is not good enough for you to land, at Seoul, Korea with 9,000 feet of runway, uh, then your orders will be to proceed to uh, Tokyo and, and land in Tokyo, or in land in Japan. And uh, we'll get a Goonie Bird to take the ambassador back to Korea. And I said, well, I've got 3,000 hours in the Goonie Bird time. And I said, if the weather is such that I can't land a KC-135 with its much heavier weight and all that, if I can't land that, uh, I'll guarantee you, that won't, because of winds, crosswind specific, I said, I'll guarantee you the C-47 won't be able to either. Well, you just, you know, follow orders. <clears throat> well, I got there, and n number one, it turned out that it was, the Code 3 was not an ambassador. It was two members of the SR-71 command post over there who had been designated to go brief the Korean ambassador because there had been two SR-71s over the course of two weeks that had made emergency landings in Korea because of hydraulic or some other malfunction. Mm -hmm. And the first time they, they soothed the ambassador's feathers by, by sending him a message, and the second time they figured, well, we better go up there and give him a full briefing. Because at that time, the United States was officially denying that the SR-71 was operating in Southeast Asia. So, okay, I got my two, uh, my two uh, lieutenant colonels from the command post, the SR-71, I'm a captain, took them in, uneventful, except for the fact that when I got there, I, I tried to c contact the command post back in Okinawa for authorization to land, and there was no way I could get in contact with them. We were too close to Okinawa to use HF radio, which depends on skipping off the atmosphere. You gotta be far distant. You can broadcast around the world, but you can't do very much short range. This was only a couple of hours away. Uh, and 
I called the command post at, at uh, uh, the base, I think it was Osan, in uh, Korea, and they're a tactical fighter base, and they don't have a command post with landlines and other surreptitious means to connect to the broader system, so they couldn't contact by landline can, to a SAC base. So I had nobody to talk to. Well, I checked the weather, the weather was adequate, no problem, so I landed the airplane. I got my primary mission taken care of and, and my, my guest passengers were on their way and having just been in, in a year in Vietnam and being aware of travel arrangements and, and all of that kind of thing, space available for other people, I had a, an empty KC-135 going back to Okinawa, which was a world port for MAC transports. So I told the operations officer, I said, if, if you've got any legal passengers that want to hop uh, space available back to Okinawa to make other connections, I said, manifest them on. And I'll come back and check with you after my weather briefing. So as I came back through, he said, yeah, you've got uh, You've got a, an army full colonel and his wife and two teenage daughters. And I said, where, where are they? And he said, they're already out in the airplane. I got them manifested, they're all legal, and so on and so forth. So I said, great, be happy to oblige. Well, again, I can't make any contact back with Okinawa to tell them about these arrangements. <laughs> so I took off with my passengers. I had to brief them, which I did, that we had no ladies bathroom facilities on there. It was a two-hour flight, and Colonel and your daughters and your wife, if they're satisfied with those accommodations, then I'm more than happy to take you, because they were trying to get a hop back to the States. Mm -hmm. So they went along. Well, we have, they had a rule in SAC, and I'm sure they still do, that prior to landing, you had to check in with the local command post and give them your maintenance status and your refuel, refueling state and all those things for turnaround of the aircraft. And I told them, uh, I, that I had a, a VIP on board. I had a colonel and his wife and his two teenage daughters. And uh, that I was gonna bring the airplane in and bring it into the, the SAC ramp there and I'd like to get a, a staff car to take them over to the MAC terminal on the other side of the base so they can check in for their space A travel. So <laughs> I kind of got a little silence, but they said they'd take care of it. I landed at uh, Kadena, and as I pulled off the, the, ramp, or the runway to get to the, the ramp, there was a Jeep with a 50 caliber machine gun on the back end, which many of them had on them all the time, but this one was manned. There was a guy <laughs> behind the weapon, and it was a follow me, you know, to follow taxi behind him where it went. And instead of taking me into the SAC ramp with the normal procedures of, of having me swing in and stop in front of the revetments and then the tow truck or tow bar would back mm -hmm. it into the pit. They had me nose in to the pit. And as I turned into the revetments, which were the corrugated steel reinforced uh, three-sided thing that completely surrounds the aircraft when it's parked, uh, I noticed on top of the revetment, which is about uh, 20 feet above the ground, there were two uh, armed uh, security police guys on their bellies with the guns pointed at my airplane. <laughs> I'm kind of wondering what this is all about. I shut down the engines, the staff car arrived, the colonel greeted the colonel, the other uh, Air Force colonel greeted the Army colonel and his family and whisked them off. And I was told in the cockpit that as, you so, as soon as you finish with your maintenance debriefing, you're to report to the wing commander's office, which I did. And the first thing he did when I walked into the room was he informed me that uh, my rights and that I was under potential of an Article 15 disciplinary action under UCMJ. And I was kind of taken aback and, he proceeded to tell me that I had broken every rule in the rule book of, on carrying passengers, space available passengers on a SAC aircraft and carrying VIPs that were unauthorized and I hadn't gotten executed from the command post to do this mission and blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and mind you, I had just been through the SAC uh, instructor's course 
and I had been given an update on rules and regulations and all that kind of stuff. And, and I was an instructor pilot for a short while before that. And having come out of Southeast Asia and a you know, combat tour, I had a lot more exposure to that than your average SAC pilot probably did anyway. Anyway, I proceeded to uh, explain my actions by telling the uh, wing commander that uh, I thought he was mistaken because under the, the rules that are in the book, the only restriction on space available travel on a SAC aircraft is that it, they cannot be on the aircraft when it's involved in an operational mission, i.e. refueling, number one. Number two, if it's a, a ranking officer or VIP that uh, he can't be traveling on a mission that has been scheduled just for his convenience, which was not the case, and, and there was uh, a couple of other similar type of situations, and uh, the wing commander uh, kind of dismissed me and told me that I was on suspension and quarters until I heard from him. So I went back and I contacted my, my SAC people, uh, uh, them, and I told them what was going on, and, and next thing I know, the, the command post there for the SR-71 operation was on the phone to, to uh, Omaha and to, to Beale to get this all ruffled. In the meantime, my name had come out of the majors list. And I'm thinking, there goes my promotion <laughs> because of this infraction. But it wasn't an infraction. I was totally legal because I was outside the U.S. It was not an operational mission and so on and so forth. And uh, they kept me on the hook for 72 hours before they came back and determined officially that, yeah, I was right and they were wrong. And <laughs> And what was really comical about it was when I heard the explanation was the individual that was at the reins in the command post in, at uh, Okinawa at that time thought these kind of things don't happen on SAC aircrafts. And therefore, I must have been be trying to give them the message that I'd been hijacked. <laughs> that was the <laughs> assumption they made. That's why they met me with an arm. Escort oh, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you, you know, um, as an aside, if you would, um, I notice you're wearing a, a uniform or and a flight cap, so to speak. That's what we call them um, of the American Legion. Yes. Uh, could, could you explain that to us, if you would? Well, uh, as the American Legion says, veterans proudly served and never quit. They're still on duty 365. I am the uh, uh, American Legion post commander for the local Westchester community American Legion post. And I thought that uh, the nature of this interview was such that, it, and, and being on camera, there would probably be a, a nice opportunity to wave the flag a little bit for the American Legion and also to pass on the message that it's true. We, many, many veterans stay involved even though they're no longer in the military, they're retired or they've been discharged. And uh, I just thought that one might be added a little interest. I notice your TITAC, that's uh, emblematic of the uh, DFC, isn't it? Yes, Distinguished Flying Cross. I see. That was something that was awarded to me uh, in uh, Vietnam for one of the missions I flew on. And. Um, I'm sure that uh, you were awarded air medals. Yes, uh, air medals were awarded. I've got uh, seven air medals. They were awarded on number of flights. The uh, 15 sorties uh, were qualified you for an air medal in combat. And right. So I have a total of seven of those that were also awarded in Vietnam. I see. I see. Um, so. You spent five years then in SAC, um, and that would take us um, to 1973. 73, right. Yeah. And your, oh, <clears throat> the promotion to major, did that come through? I, oh, yes, yeah. Uh, it, it came through right on schedule, no, no hiccups at all. <laughs> Nothing okay. in my record negative about that. Okay. So uh, in 73, you're now a major. Right. And, uh, and you're going to be leaving SAC, is that correct? Correct. Uh, as 
many people are aware in the, in the military, it's not uncommon for many people in the military to get transfers of assignment, PCS orders, permanent change of station, on average once or twice, once a year, once every two years. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate to be able to extend mine uh, through a five-year period, but after a certain point in time, and the wisdom of personnel matters, and I think it is wise for the most part, they do rotate officers particularly, as well as I'm sure senior enlisted, to different locations to broaden their experience and increase their responsibility. And so I knew as, as uh, the time approached the five-year increment that I was gonna, probably gonna be vulnerable for reassignment. Uh, as I progressed through the SAC process into the instructor pilot position, I became the chief instructor pilot for the base tankers, two, two squadrons of tankers and upgrade training for 15th Air Force, which is SAC uh, Air Force all on the west, west of the Mississippi, I think is the, the boundary. And uh, as a result of that, I was no longer flying on, with a crew on the crew force. I was flying at home on the training, local training missions for the most part. I didn't have as much TDY to Okinawa, temporary duty. And that was nice for the family for a change. But then as I got closer to the end, they had another urgent need, they had a requirement for somebody to take over the job of chief of safety for the base. And uh, they had a series, we had a new uh, wing commander there at Beale, and he was a, a gentleman who had been promoted below the zone, in other words, early, twice already, and uh, an up and coming type of guy and he'd already had two inspections, operational readiness inspection, where the safety office had been found unsatisfactory. And we didn't have a safety problem. It was really a matter of, of safety uh, administration that was the problem. And anyway, uh, they decided that since I'd had a background in flying safety from as a secondary duty in several of my other assignments, including the one in Vietnam, including the one at O'Hare, uh, that I was a likely candidate for that job. SAC had sent me off to uh, Fort Worth to go to a, a two-week training course and learn all the safety details about nuclear safety and armament safety and weapon safety, aircraft safety, ground safety, industrial safety, all those categories and specifically the duties of the chief of safety, which is more record keeping than anything else. I returned home from that temporary duty of two weeks to find that they'd had another operational readiness inspection. I was uh, planning to come home and do a little OJT under the current safety chief who was retiring in a couple of months. And he had a, another unsatisfactory. So I was called to the, to the uh, wing commander's office and he said this was my first day back from being gone for two weeks. He called me into his office and he said at noon you and I are going over and talking to the general at division headquarters and you're going to explain what you're going to do to fix this problem. <laughs> and I said I don't even know what the problem is sir. <laughs> Can I have a chance to get up to speed? No, we don't have time for that. We need to be there right after lunch. So. Long story short, I ended up the chief of safety for it in, a, in the, that particular instance. Almost at the same instant, I got, from two different sources, I got notification that I had been separately selected by the Air Force for AFIT program to, to go get a, a master's degree in industrial engineering, which was something I thought was something I'd like to do anyway. But the implementation area was to be one of three categories from that course was to be as a base uh, uh, the the office that basically is covering the base civil civil services uh, uh, industrial and uh, base maintenance and that type of stuff mm -hmm. physical uh, physical plant of the base can't remember the the title, but that was one utilization. Another one was flight test operations, 
and the third one was uh, aircraft maintenance. Well, aircraft maintenance was the one that was most likely, but they were going to put me in the in the uh, base management area, utilization field. Concurrently with that, I got notified from the Military Personnel Center that they had a requirement for a tanker qualified instructor pilot for an assignment to Canada to fly the Canadian 707 tanker. And the 707 is the is the Rolls Royce of what the SR-71, excuse me, what the KC-135 was. <coughs> and I weighed all those things in my mind. I had a new job as chief of safety for at least six months, and I had the, uh, the other opportunities. And I, I finally went back and, and went back to the personnel center and I said, you know, I'd like to decline without prejudice that opportunity to go to AFIT because I don't think the career field coming out of that, going and being, uh, taking care of bridges and plumbing and stuff in the base is appropriate to an aeronautical engineering degree pilot. And that was where their need was, was mm -hmm. for that field. So they granted me that they, they would uh, accept my uh, request and, and refu uh, to refuse the assignment and gave me the assignment to Canadian Armed Forces. And that was a special category, SPECAT as they call it, uh, assignment to Trenton, Ontario, the, the, the Trenton Air Base in Canada. And that was the headquarters of Air, uh, Canadian Air Transport Command at that time. And they had just in about eight months prior to that time had replaced a fleet of global capable CL-44 transports. They're reciprocating four-engine uh, transports with a swing tail for carrying cargo and replaced them with five Boeing 707 commercial aircraft, two of which had been modified by Boeing to help the Canadian image that they were justified in that aircraft by having a global combat capability by making tankers out of those airplanes. And their mission requirement was uh, to have somebody that would be able to come in and help train them in air refueling operations, which they had just attempted to accomplish before I arrived. And uh, so I, I had all the qualifications that I was already a, a chief instructor pilot in the, in the Boeing aircraft, which as far as they were concerned, they were the same aircraft. Right. But they were a totally different species of aircraft. But uh, so I, I accepted that position and uh, I, I arrived in Canada and the squadron commander, who was a lieutenant colonel, he said that he, uh, he thought that since I had all this time in, in the Boeing aircraft in the KC-135 that I could just forego any transition training into their aircraft and, and uh, just jump right in and do it. And I, I told him that, you know, when I look at the differences, your 707 is a bigger, heavier, more powerful aircraft, and you have a larger crew force. You've got a flight engineer on that one with all the engine instruments behind that they're managing. And I said, you've got a different way of operating, and, and it's going to be even more different with the tanker role. I, I suggested to him it would be better if I went through his normal transition training into the, the Boeing, Mm -hmm. which for his people, normally that's people transitioning from a C-130 or from a commuter jet type aircraft. And he agreed, and so I went through that. The first six months of my flying there was done basically like normal airline operations, scheduled air, airplane base to base carrying passengers. And at the end of that six months, they put me into their refueler training program, which was both receiver and tanker people working together. And uh, they had, as I say, just two tankers, that it, two airplanes had been modified to tankers. They used, unlike the KC-135, they used a couple of photographs here. Uh, this, this was a Canadian tanker. And if you look closely at the wingtip, it looks like there's a, a red torpedo on the wingtip. 
-hmm. Well, that's a refueling store. And there's one on the other side also. And there's a boom that comes down. I think I've got a picture of it here. There's a close-up in the middle of the boom. And, uh, excuse me, the torpedo, the, the wingtip tank, or, or ferry, or pod, right. if that's the right. And below you can see him refueling the F-5, which they call the Canadian CF-5, is the F-5 fighter aircraft. And you can see out of the, the uh, boom pod, there's a boom that comes down about 30 degree angle and spills out about 40 feet of hose, which has a, what looks kind of like a badminton birdie on the end of the hose, which is the drogue. And the fighters have a probe on the side that they fly up to and plug into that, that drogue. And that's called the probe and drogue. Probe and drogue. <clears throat> and that's much more suited to smaller aircraft because they don't have the amount of fuel rate transfer that they can do in a boom, which in the KC-135 was designed mainly for tanker operations and transport. So anyway, it was because it's a different animal and it's dealing with more crew members on the tanker to do the operation. In, in this operation, the tanker basically becomes a, a platform like a flying gas station and they, they sit there and the fighters do all the work. They fly and make connections, make contacts and disconnects with help and coordination from the crew on the tanker. Where in the case of KC-135, the, the receiver pulls up in formation and the boom operator does all the work of putting the, ho or the uh, boom into the receptacle. So anyway, it was quite a, a different concept. So what I found was that I went through their training program, which was very rudimentary <clears throat> at the time. They'd only, be, they'd only been doing this for less than six months at that point. And I went through their training program, and when I got through with the program, they handed me my certificate, and they said, now you are Mr. Air Refueling for the Canadian Armed Forces. <laughs> We, we wash our hands of it. We're scared to death of this animal is what they kind of said because it's, you know, in the, in the world of flying fighters, the big objective is don't get close to big airplanes. Avoid them. And now they're wanting to train them to get close to them and sit still around them and do that sort of thing. So it, it proved very interesting and the, the capability was very limited initially. Now, the the amount of fuel that they were able to transfer using that probe and drogue method, was the fuel that's stored in these wing pods? No, there's no fuel in the wing pod. It's all mechanism. The, the pod is plumbed into the main aircraft fuel system, and we were able to transfer fuel to the certain tanks that were plumbed for the pod and then transfer that off to them. So okay. Okay. it was much less sophisticated, but probably a lot more complex. Mm -hmm. than it was in a KC-135 designed for that purpose. Those pods could be put on and taken off of the airplane, uh, airplane configuration changed for tanking in about four hours. Mm -hmm. And that included interior change in the aircraft for the crew composition as well. <clears throat> but here's, this is my, on the bottom, this is my favorite photograph of that. This was one that was taken during a training film that I helped the Canadians put together and produced to uh, improve on the quality of training. And uh, one of the things we found out uh, in the training course that I went through that when they would put tanker and, and the fighter crews together and train them for, for a new situation, it would typically take a Canadian fighter pilot uh, two or three days of attempts, and, and I'm talking four or five approaches to contact, which they weren't able to make contact with that little badminton feather that was waving the breeze out there, right. and turbulence and, and aerodynamic flow and so on, because there was so much to, to understand about the airflow and so on going around that and what, what we had learned and what they had learned about it, that they thought it would be an uh, initiative that I took would be well worthwhile to try and put that on camera. Mm -hmm. so that they could see it firsthand rather than a sketch on the blackboard right. and see what was going on. 
And so we spent during the, I was there for three years, and during that time play, we spent one whole year of that uh, doing the filming to make that training film. Mm -hmm. And the training film was, a, was both a training film and a PR film, one with inside the other, where they were put it out and aired it and with interviews on television, public television, to make the public more aware of it as well. And it had a, a mission scenario of how they were able to task this operation to the unit that I was in and convert the airplane into a tanker and then take a, a formation of four fighters across to Norway in a NATO support role, which was the, the category of the assignment that I was on there as a NATO exchange pilot with the Canadian Armed Forces. <coughs> and uh, now you refueled uh, two fighter planes at, uh, simultaneously? Yes, but, but in formation of four in a typical situation. There'd be four airplanes that would, would come up on the wing and we would cycle two at a time through the refueling. Oh, we see. only had two receptacles, but we, they would normally travel in formation as up to four aircraft. Okay. And for some training flights, we just used two. Mm -hmm. uh, as in this one, you only see the two, and in this one you see the, the top photograph there, which was one that was in the, in the local press and the Air Force Times was a picture of me and, and the uh, four receivers flying in the tanker. When the article first came out, it sounded like somebody had really discovered some big thing. The Canadians had discovered in-flight refueling. Mm. When SAC had been doing that for almost from the end of World War II. Yes. In one form or another, very rudimentary, but, but it was, uh, I, I think I have a picture of that in here someplace. Um. Well, I don't know if we have time to find it. So, but, so you would be refueling two fighter planes and there would be two more that were waiting in position off. Right. Off. and after <clears throat> you released the two, the other two would come up and right. refuel themselves there also. Now for safety standpoints, uh, and that's typical worldwide, is that we would only, when we, we've got two aircraft positioned to refuel behind the drogue, we'd only let one of them advance at a time to contact. Right. So the total focus was on that one aircraft because that's the major time of maximum risk. Right. And once one once came in and in contact, then we could clear the other one in. Mm -hmm. And under the Canadian concept that we developed, uh, the things operated to their comfort level under the notion that the, the lead aircraft, which was the tanker, was in control of that entire operation. Right. So we had to coordinate from the cockpit to our uh, boom operators, there was one on either side of the aircraft focused on his particular side and we would from the cockpit direct the formations and do the airplane moves around until we got two airplanes behind the refueling receptacles and at that point we turned control over, I would turn control over to the boom, boom op operators to clear number one and then number two or mm -hmm. what, what have you. So there was a lot of movement outside the aircraft and it was critical to safety to make sure that everybody knew what everybody was doing, which meant you'd have to have standardized procedures, which was something they just didn't, didn't have in their skill set. And this training uh, that you were doing for the Canadian Air Force, were there any accidents while you were? Uh... Not involving anything that was any, uh, any uh, loss of aircraft or anything like that. We had, a, we had an occasional malfunction or, or uh, minor damage to an aircraft and uh, to receiver aircraft, get a, get a bad approach and get a tip off and have the, the hose drogue whip around the airplane and smash into the canopy or smash mm -hmm. into the nose of the aircraft, things like that. Uh, we had, I had one incident uh, that is in my uh, information that I gave you that uh, we encountered, we talked about it, what would, what would happen if we had a situation, a malfunction on the tanker, if one of those uh, refueling pods malfunctioned and we were not able to retract the hose and had to land with it strung, strung out behind us. And we had, we talked about it, but it had never been implemented. <coughs> and we had one happen. <laughs> and I had the, the occasion to uh, do it. I was in, for the most part, I was the air refueling, uh, operations officer within the squadron, but I had the responsibility of a, 
of a brigadier general in the armed forces as far as tasking resources. And we'd, we'd go on a deployment and we would, I would send out a deployment order or a frag order and designate that we needed to have so many slots for billeting and we needed to have the, the big hangar we could put the 707 in for winter operations and they'd have to park their fighters out in the snow and cold and, and that kind of stuff. But in this particular instance, uh, we had an actual, we were flying a mission up over the North Pole and one of the refueling stores, the right, right side refueling pod failed during a extension or retraction, I don't recall which mechanical part failed in it. <clears throat> and we could bring the boom up with the hoist that was built into it, but we couldn't retract the hose. Mm -hmm. So it was hanging out 35 feet out of the back and would obviously be touching the ground. And surprising, Canadian bases didn't at that time and probably still don't have foaming capability on their runways. Because they figured most of the time, a lot of time they got snow and ice, so they <laughs> It just wouldn't allow them to happen. Well, anyway, uh, it was, this was in the summertime. We were up there, we had all our procedures established and they were, were well trained. And we sent the fighters back to their home base after topping them all off on one side of the aircraft. We had a procedure developed that we could cycle all four aircraft to one side mm -hmm. and do it within the time frame. They could all get a top off and get to their destination. And once doing that, then we returned to our base at Trenton. And uh, I came in and made a low pass over the runway to, to visualize. My objective was to land the airplane so that wingtip was out over the grass off the edge of the runway. Unfortunately, out over the grass, as you recall from your flying days, there's also every thousand feet, there's a runway oh, light right. and yeah. some other obstacles out there. And we certainly didn't want to wrap that hose around one of those. So. We had a distance in the grass of about, oh, maybe 20 feet between the edge of the runway and where these lights were. <clears throat> so I made a low pass because I couldn't see the right wing and I couldn't have turned my head while I was flying anyway that far to look behind. <clears throat> so my observers in the back were telling me when I got it over midway between the lights and the edge of the runway and I could take a reference point on the runway as to right. what the proper alignment was and we went around the second time and the, the uh, Runway, the second runway that they had at Trenton was a, a crossing runway that was about, I think it was at about uh, 6,000 feet from the approach end of the main runway. And my objective was hopefully to be able to stop the airplane before I crossed that, because if I had that thing skipping, the hose is full of fuel all the way out to the drogue. And I, number one, I didn't want to wrap it on something that would yank the directional control away from me, and I didn't want it to jump off the grass up onto the concrete and make sparks and possibly grind it off and set a fire. So I did something that the Canadians didn't think was possible to do. I landed the airplane and used maximum braking as well as maximum thrust reverse all the way down to stopped. And normally in a, in a thrust reverse aircraft of that type, uh, you're always supposed to take it out of thrust reverse when you decelerate below 40 knots to keep re-ingesting ground stuff into the engine. Well, that wasn't my primary concern. It was get the airplane stopped. And we were fairly heavy at the time. We were probably at about 250,000 pounds. And I stopped the airplane before we got the drogue on the run crossing runway. Mm. I got a couple backfires <laughs> out of the higher thrust setting, but as we slowed down, I slowly eased the power off so I wasn't maximum th reverse thrust. Mm. But that was, that operation was what was the key event in my tour there, which uh, generated, with all the publicity and all that, uh, that generated the award of the Chief of the Defense Staff commendation to me and I was the only non-Canadian that ever received, only one other non-Canadian ever received that. that, that and what's that called? The Chief of Defense Staff Commendation. And uh, that's this little little gold bar oh, yes. on my cap that's three mm -hmm. maple leaves uh -huh. between them. And being a foreign award, it's always at the bottom of the stack. So <laughs> it's, 
I see. And uh, there's there's several articles that I have uh, some photographs there that I'll leave with you for this to uh, that uh, give you the uh, some of the background of that. There was a so there was an award uh, certificate provided for that, and there was an article written up in their Flying Safety Magazine about that. <coughs> I would imagine. So there was, and it was it was a shame because I had called into the through their command center there at, at Trenton and two hours before we arrived and asked them if they would get their safety photographer out with movie films so that we could document this, whatever the outcome, right. but as a, as a procedure for training purposes and so on. And uh, I don't remember if it was on a weekend or not, but as it turned out, there wasn't a photographer available and that had the equipment to do it. So okay. <laughs> we had the great circumstances for a, a learning video on, yeah. or movie about something and it didn't get captured. So um, you spent how long with the Canadian? I was there three years. Three it was years. a two year assignment and I, so I requested an extension and they, they granted the extension. To three years? To three years. So <clears throat> this is 1976? Uh, yeah, summer of 76. I think. I see. And you're still a major? Uh, let me think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, where do you go from, uh, unless there's something else you want to add about the Canadian experience? Well, I could go on and on, but. Okay. <laughs> uh, so where did you get transferred next then? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I knew at the, at the time that it was the time that I was going to be forced to leave because the three year was the limit. Again, I contacted the personnel center through the, uh, the program office in Ottawa that, that uh, handled all the exchange officers throughout Canada that came out of the U.S. Air Force, <coughs> which there were more than a couple of dozen, I guess, at various bases and various capacities, and fighter pilots and, and maintenance officers and so on and so forth. And they said, well, what would you like to do? And I said, well, I guess with what I know about, the, the most likely location for me to go would be to uh, back to SAC in a, in a potential squadron commander, KC-135 squadron commander position. And uh, I'd been gone from SAC too long. They weren't interested in getting me back. I was out of touch as far as they were concerned. So that up, up avenue was blocked. So I said, well, I spent so much time involved with developing some of these capabilities, worked with Boeing on a number of projects, both in SAC and in the Canadians. Uh, Air Force Systems Command with my engineering degree maybe the program manager. Well, Air Force Systems Command didn't know me from, from youth. So I said, well, I guess the last thing would be as uh, Air Force Logistics Command in the KC-135 system management area. I've got a lot of experience with that. And uh, that's what they ended up assigning me to ultimately is that third choice. And, and that was, that was what at, again? At Oklahoma City, Air, uh -huh. Oklahoma City Air Logistics Center. And uh, I arrived there in the midsummer of, of what uh, year? Of '76. Okay. And I had a month's leave going on, and while I was at home getting the new house moved in and organized and the lawn planted and so on and so forth, I got a call, and and uh, they said the the assignment what I was going to, what I was designated for, was kind of secondary to a more critical need. They needed engine managers in the engine division. And so I said, well, I, I really don't know that much about engines except when you push the throttle up, they go, and when you pull it back, they slow down and things like that. But he said, no, that's what we need. We need management. We don't need technical ability. So I went into that position for about three months, and I, I found that that was a total mismatch. I wasn't being utilized. So I requested a transfer back to the 135 weapon system office and that change was made to take place. And I walked into the office and I was, this was in the January time frame of uh, 77. And they were in the middle of a crisis with structural integrity in the 135. They were developing wing cracks. And so I became the expert on structural integrity for, with my aeronautical engineering degree, mm -hmm. which I never used except in a 
hands-on capacity in flying. And uh, it was an interesting situation. The KC-135, when it was designed, uh, did not use the same structure in the wings as the 707 did because they wanted more strength for carrying the heavier loads. More, more strength, the alloy they used to do that, more strength gave them the strength of stainless steel compared to aluminum, but it was more brittle. Stainless steel. Well, it was, it was actually aluminum alloy, but it was comparable to stainless steel okay. in its properties. Uh, that resulted in the fact that in, in uh, the cyclic loading, takeoffs and landings, flying through turbulence, things like that, was causing the wings to flex sufficiently that it was developing cracks in the wing skin. And of course, the wing is wet. It's a fuel tank. Mm -hmm. So when it cracks, the first thing that happens is you start getting fuel leakage. The second thing that happens with the design and the structural aspect of it was that if it cracks, the wing becomes slightly weakened by that crack from one rivet to another. Right. And that causes that, again, under continuing loads to, to get longer and longer until the wing fails and comes off. Right. The airplane that they found that in happened to be a VP or a v, VC-135, which is a, a VIP airplane flown out of Washington, D.C. that's used to carry senators and congressmen and other high-ranking members below the president level. And those, that was more critical because that was actually a, not a tanker, but it was a 135 cargo version. It was restricted to a lighter load than tankers but it also gets experienced more like an airline load with lots of takeoff and landings, A to B to C and you know, short hops at heavy weights. So it had a lot more cyclic damage on the airplanes and they had an elaborate t program that they developed to track that by tail number for every aircraft in the fleet as to what their projected life was based on the cyclic loading that we, they were mm -hmm. recording in the maintenance records. And this airplane had the equivalent, it had the actual flying hours of about 12,000 hours, but had the equivalent of about 20,000 hours on it in terms of structural time. Mm -hmm. Well, that involved a major uh, program with Boeing to develop a wing skin program to reskin re all of the fleet. And then we had to figure out how to manage doing it to the ones in the worst condition first because we're dealing with 700 airplanes. And the modification to reskin it is up to a year in length initially. Yeah, right. So what you're talking about a lot of airplanes restricted or possibly even grounded. The fleet was almost grounded at one point. And uh, that's another very lengthy story, but uh, they came up with an interim program. The, the critical bending moment of the wing or, or the critical structural is where the, the wing attaches to the fuselage. Okay. The outboard of the fuselage, the, the wings are wet cell fuel tanks. In the center wing area, it's a rubber bladder. And there's also a lot of stuff around it, you know, the landing gear mechanism and, and the, the water ejection system tanks and all that kind of stuff. And if cracks develop between rivets in the wings themselves, you can see the seepage and know where to identify the problem. But in that center wing area, it's all closed and it's in bladder, so you don't see the cracks. So what the, the engineers came up with was a, a system that put a lot of sensors, microphones, if you will, on either side in that area, either side of the center line of the fuselage, and they would hear a failure of a crack developing, popping from one ribbit to the next. And that would set off a light in the cockpit, which would tell them potential wing failure. Well, it, for simplicity, they say wing failure on the light that had a red <laughs> lens on it. Well, do you know what a pilot's reaction is when they see a light flash on in the cockpit that says wing failure after they've done a couple of these? He wants to get a tail on the ground, right. but right now. And it created a lot of <laughs> you know, heart failures almost. Certainly. So, and it did give false alarms too. You know, if you, you ran through a hailstorm, you get popping sounds on the skin <laughs> and it would set it off. So they, the first fix was to change the light bulb in it to a 
yellow light so it wasn't quite so alarming. And then take that decal off there that said wind crack. <laughs> but they had to put that on the airplanes and, and operate that way until the airplane was cycled into the, its turn to get the new skin put on. And the, the new skin was, they had the dilemma that in order to increase the, the strength of the, of the skin, they would have to make the skin thicker. And if they put that on the outside, it would change the total aerodynamics of the wing, so they have to go through massive testing. If they put it on the inside, it would take up space that normally is fuel, mm -hmm. to lower the fuel. So what they ended up doing in, in the Boeing final design was to change the material to a more ductile, more flexible, less brittle, if you will, uh, alloy of aluminum so they could maintain the same thickness of the skin and the same outside surface of the skin. And part of the space saving was done by the fact with the later technology that existed in that time frame compared to when the airplane was originally designed, they could eliminate having all these splices between shorter wing panels that made up the wing. As it went out, they were able to manufacture a, a full lower wing skin and fewer panels. Okay. So that meant there was less reinforcing ribs or bulkheads right. at those joints. So they were able to come up with that fix and it was, it's, it's quite a complex and elaborate process, but. And this is why you're in charge at this. Well, I was in charge from it because the philosophy at Oklahoma City was that the real technology and, and uh, knowledge base in the Air Force resides with the civil service personnel who were there for 20, 30 years of time, very long longevity. And the blue suit community, which represented the, the Air Force uh, enlisted and officers that worked in that environment, were the voice between the civil service and the using people. Mm -hmm. I had the degree in, in auto, aeronautical engineering with major instructors, so it was a nice fit, and I became the the person in charge of that committee, and I was sitting as the committee chair over all the senior design and structural engineers from Boeing and Lockheed and all those who were called together to analyze this problem and come up with a fix. So it was more of a middleman type job that I had there rather than one that was making a lot of decisions. But it was a, an important position, both from my standpoint and, and uh, since I could, I could relate and could talk to the terms that they were using in engineering technology, then I could formulate the presentations that had to go out to the field to the, to the major commands operating the aircraft and explain what we were doing and why we were doing what we were doing and why it worked and why it wouldn't work and, and what it was, the impact was gonna be and come up to a solution and I ended up having ultimately to, to go all the way up to the Secretary of the Air Force and brief him as to what this, and that was a, that was a briefing that should have taken uh, probably about 10 hours to complete. And at his level, he only wanted to give me 30 minutes. So needless to say, I got uh, a lot of uh, dry runs through various echelons of command structure between me and four-star general before the final briefing went to him. And, right. and he was there just to get familiarity with it so that he could say yes or no. This is what we're gonna do. So they eventually ended up reskinning. Is that the right term? Right. Uh, all 700 of the yes. Well, uh, there there was a few that uh, were retired ultimately, I but see. very small percentage. But basically, they did that, and that became a part of the major activity, uh, as you can well imagine. The 135 fleet at that point in time was 15 years old, 15 to 20 years old. Uh, it is now past the 50 year anniversary and it'll be going on to 75 for some of them, not all of them. They're still flying. They're still flying. Yeah. And all of the fleet was done then and part of that ongoing renovation and keeping an operational requirement uh, has resulted in re-engineing it with two programs. One of them was putting the big high bypass fan engine on it, which is called the KC-135R and that's the newest and latest technology. And there was an interim program, which was something that I initiated that was very unique, never been done before, and that is that I 
had the opportunity, a windfall opportunity, to get some information and develop a program that I took to the Pentagon and sold to the Pentagon to buy a fleet of retiring 707 aircraft and cannibalize the engines, the struts, the thrust reversers, the landing gear, and a bunch of other parts off of them and use them to re-engine 131 135s. And that was a $15 billion program cost savings compared cost to savings, the Cost savings, absolutely. Cost savings, and it gave uh, about, at the outset, it gave about uh, 90, roughly 90% of the capability of the KCR in terms of increased thrust, increased reliability, increased offload capability because you could carry more gas farther and more efficiently and mm -hmm. reduction in environmental issues, getting rid of water injection and doing all those things. And uh, it was is something that it that was called the KC-135E, and I have a photograph of it here if I can find it. Not that it'll be much to see, except for the trained eye. I can find it. That's the KC-135E, and about the only thing that identifies it is that if you look at the engine, you'll see they've got this cowling that goes back rather than being smooth cowled on it, and that's the thrust reverser and the fan outlet, because these have the uh, turbofan engines on them that are the low bypass engines that the commercials had. It's the same engine, basically, that was on the B model of the 135, which was introduced in the early 1960s as a straight cargo uh, Mack airplane. Uh, the interesting mm -hmm. thing that happened on that was that uh, when I got wind of this opportunity, I had the experience with the Canadian operations, so I knew what the higher performance engines would do for the airplane, and this is a smaller aircraft than the Boeing 707 is, so it would be a real boost. But I, I ended up putting together a presentation. I got a, a proposal from, that came in from a senior vice president of American Airlines. And he said, I've, he found his way to my office in Oklahoma City, and he said, I've been to Pentagon with this, and I've been to, to headquarters USAF with this, and the SAC headquarters, and they've all told me that we don't buy used airplanes. We only specify what we need, and we get new airplanes. And just go away. We don't want anything to do with you. And I said, well, I might be interested. He said, well, I think that, you know, these, we've got a, a fleet of 75 707s that are in very good condition. And American Airlines was the top of, of all of them in terms of the way they maintained their airplanes. And he said, I thought we might, the Air Force might be interested in making tankers out of these airplanes. Because he's got a, he had done his homework and he knew we had a shortfall and booms available if we had a maximum uh, two, two uh, war effort going on. And I talked to him for a little while and I said, you know, the, what, what you're offering is very interesting, but I said it'd be next to impossible to reconfigure a 707 to a tanker configuration with all of the other subsystems that are involved in it and uh, the plumbing and all those types of things and the structural aspects of it. And I said, but on the other hand, most of those parts are already almost interchangeable with the basic KC-135 because they were all built on the same toolings or off offspring of the same tooling. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what are you talking about? And he said, well, he says, I'm here to offer a proposal to you and, or to the government, if you're interested, that we will sell you the 707-300, which is the same airplane I flew in Canada. And, and uh, basically all the components that you want off of it to use for cannibalizing, we'll zero time them, overhaul them and bring them up to highest, highest quality of maintenance. And we'll do the physical modification for $3 million an airplane. We'll sell you the airplane and do the modification, $3 million an airplane. And the older models, the smaller 707-100 series and, and the in-betweens, but with that same engine, uh, we will do that. We'll sell you the airplane 
with the modification and the zero timing of the parts for $1 million in your point. Well, that's less than you pay for a Learjet. <laughs> you know, you come right down to it. So I put the, the thing together and I went, uh, ran it up through channels through my, my commanders there at Oklahoma City and, and through uh, the headquarters AFLC up to the four-star general and got their, all their blessings on it. And I went to the Pentagon with it and, and briefed the Air, Air Council which is a panel of 12 two-star level general officers in the Air Force or their uh, SES, Senior Executive Service, civilian capacity, mm -hmm. civil service capacity. And I went through it. Well, at that time, we were already going through the, the ginning up the modification for the KCR with the big engines, the new engines on it. And I, I went through all these details and I, I got their attention when I was getting kind of the give and take situation where the one side of the house was saying, well, we don't, we, we don't do that sort of thing. We always do new stuff. And, and the other part of it was and continuing with that. The money that we've got available is now being used on the KC-10 and the KCR re-engineering program. And if, if we, take on this project that it's going to take money away from those projects and, and we don't want to do that. We're guarding those programs. And, and uh, we got down to the, the bottom line and I said, well, I, I want to make one last point in the presentation. I said that the, the Boeing company has, we've just completed selection of the KCR engine, the CFM 56, and Boeing wants 300 I don't remember the exact figure, but over $300 million for the first prototype with all the engineering and, and fit up with the, the test airplane to do that. And it's gonna take them three years or four years, whatever the number was. And I had the numbers there with me and I said, for the same dollar amount and for the same time period involved, we can do this KCE re-engineering program for 65 airplanes and put 65 more booms in the air. <laughs> and there were still some back and forth with the generals and the, the two generals, the commander of the Air National Guard and the commander of the Air Force Reserves said, well, if the rest of you guys aren't interested, we're interested and we fund this stuff out of state money and we're gonna buy those airplanes because they'll give us an airplane that operates out of the civilian fields that they're currently operating out of and it'd be so much more user friendly mm -hmm. out there. It'd be so much more user friendly in those communities, so much easier on our pilots because they're used to flying the commercial aircraft, et cetera, et cetera. And anyway, it ended up that that program was implemented. That's wonderful. And the saving. We, we did 161 aircraft and we bought another 20 or so aircraft that were used as 707 aircraft for test beds for Joint Stars, another program you may or may not be familiar with. Yeah. You're familiar with the AWACS with yes. the big saucer sure. on top? Yeah. Well, that's an air to air weapon system, mm -hmm. radar. The Joint Stars was one where it's got a canoe underneath the fuselage, which is down looking radar, which is battlefield radar management. Right. And they, they had that system developed and they had a platform to put it on. And they'd started off with a new 707 and Boeing didn't want to sell them any of those because they wanted to close down that line. They wanted to move on to something that was more automated. And so they, they put the initial joint stars on eight of those, I think that's the correct number, eight aircraft mm. that came out of that same buy that we gathered up all these retiring 707s sure. that were being put in the bone yard. Um, we're uh, rapidly approaching <coughs> the end of our interview. Um, so after you uh, left this position, what, where did you go? This at the end of my tour at Oklahoma City, I, I uh, took retirement and I went to work, uh, working in the aerospace industry with, initially with E-Systems in Greenville, Texas, which is, has been bought up by Raytheon. It was a spinoff of Link Temco bought at an airport there in Greenville and they, they were the primary manufacturer uh, uh, modifiers of aircraft, including the presidential aircraft and the RC-135 reconnaissance fleet 
and they're very much into electronics, but also into airframe modification. Now, when did you get promoted to lieutenant colonel? I got promoted to lieutenant colonel about six months after I arrived at Oklahoma City. I see. Um, I notice here in this one picture, um, it shows a variety of different uh, medals. Uh, I, I think I recognize uh, the one there, that's a command pilot. Wing, right, is that command correct? pilot wings. What does that mean? Uh, that means that Colonel? you've got uh, over 4,000 hours of flying time and uh, you're at least a major. And there's some other criteria and I don't recall what they are, but it's, it's the, the highest level that you can get in the, in the pilot's category. Yes. And pilots that don't fly a lot of hours, like fighter pilots that only have one or two hours flight time and so on, many times have a hard time getting to, to that before they get to lieutenant colonel or higher. Right. And I'd earned mine as a major. The um, starting from the left to right, I think the one on the left is a distinguished flying cross. Right, distinguished flying cross. The next one is a meritorious service medal, which is a uh, fairly high level, uh, but these are ordered in, in uh, precedence or, of importance on the scale. I've got mm -hmm. two of the Mer Meritorious Service Medal. The next one is the Air Medal, I believe. No, the Air Force Commendation Medal. I don't have an Air Medal on that one. I don't, no, I don't have an Air Medal on that. Uh, the Air Medal would be on that line. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Air Force Commendation Medal, I got uh, two of those during the course of my career. No, I'm mistaken. That's the Air Medal. Yeah, the Air Medal is next right. to the Meritorious Service Medal. I, mm -hmm. I misspoke. I'm looking through it from behind. Yeah. <laughs> then the Air Force Commendation Medal is the one next to that. And then the, the other two are Vietnam Service and Vietnam Campaign Medal. Right. And then the Canadian Medal is, or Commendation is down underneath there. This was a, a close up header on a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation I made for some speaking engagements. And just kind of waving my flag. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to tell you, this has been uh, one of the best interviews we've had. It's uh, remarkable, uh, your career. Well, thank you. It, and, it's, uh, it's a very difficult job, uh, as you can certainly appreciate, to try and compress 20 years into yeah. a two-hour yeah. interview. But it was so uh, educational and enlightening. Yeah. and. Uh, and uh, well, thank certainly you. worthwhile for us, uh, part of the Veterans History Project. I want to thank you very much for allowing us to conduct this interview with you. Oh, Ray, right, thank you very much for allowing me to tell my story a little bit. Yeah, and and I hope it's entertaining and useful to other people. Well, it is, and uh, I want to thank you for your service to our country, too. Thank you, Ray. Yes, sir.